Welcome to Teddy Daycare. We pride ourselves on providing the highest standard of care for all infants and small children of up to four years of age. Your kids will be at home in our safe, loving environment where we have plenty of crafts and toys to keep them busy throughout the day. We have space for both indoor and outdoor play thanks to our idyllic location by the woods. And with our safe perimeter fencing, you can rest assured knowing nothing can get in or out. Are you working late? Then no worries, we can provide supper and keep the kids entertained, even after dark. So what are you waiting for? If you Hello my fellow gnomes, how are you all doing? We are back for episode 10 and we're going to be taking a look at creating cutscenes. Now the good news is they're relatively straightforward to set up, though they can involve quite a lot of different bits. So what we're going to do today is start off by taking a look at a few basic examples to show you how you can get started. Then we'll build on them a bit before finally showing you how I'll be adding them to my own Teddy game. Now, if you watched the last episode, you've already got a reasonable idea of how this works. So you see in that last shot, I had my camera all the way down here, even though I was spawning up there. And I've got these two parts here, uh, cam one and cam two. And if we look down inside the starter player script, you see I've got this local script which was setting the camera. And if we have a look inside, you can see all I'm doing here is I'm just defining a variable for the camera, creating the camera type descriptable so I can control it, telling it what I'm gonna set it to, and then giving it a position or the C frame, which in this case is camera one, which is that one that was right down here. So let's take things a step up from that then. Maybe we want to bring in this other camera over here. We will, how about we try and tween them between the two. So if we want to move from this position over to down here. Now tween service is just a way of uh, interpolating between two positions. So first off we'll get that service. And now we have the service we can start to create our tween. Now the first thing you need when you create a tween is an object to tween, which in this case will be the camera because that's the thing we want to change. Next up, you need to provide some info. So you'll see a lot of people just go tween info dot new and then just provide uh, one, which is kind of like a shorthand way of doing it things. So that means it will just be one second long and then provide the rest, the rest as default. Um, but we can actually do a lot more settings than that. So if we open up this here, we can call this config and we'll set this to tween info dot new. But this time we're going to look at all the different options we have. So the first one is just a time. So let's set this to four seconds, for example. Then next up, we've got enum.easing style. Now we've got a few options here. Um, we can do bounce, elastic, exponential, uh, but we will just do a linear one. So it just moves in a continuous fashion. It doesn't speed up or do anything too fancy. Next up is enum.easing direction. Is it going slow to fast or fast to slow, for example? Um, I'll use in out here. I think that's quite a good one. Next up is how many times you want it to repeat. So if you're going in loop, for example, you can actually put minus one and it will uh, keep repeating for you. But we don't want it to repeat uh, two or, or three times. We don't want it to repeat at all. So we just put zero. Uh, then if you want it to reverse, so if you wanted it to go to the position and then back again, uh, I don't think we want to do this, so we'll just put false. And then finally, a delay time, so how long you want to wait before the tween starts. Uh, I think it might be a good idea for us to add delay because we're going to be waiting for the player to spawn in. So let's put a, a five second delay on that. So then down here, instead of just uh, saying tweeninfo.new, we can actually reference our config. Okay. And then finally, the last thing you need for a tween is the actual property we want to tween of the camera. So we put that in these little curly brackets and we want to change its position. So we say C frame equals, and then we need to give it a C frame value. And to do that, we're gonna just use the position of cam two. And then once we've got our tween defined, we just tap to play just like we would an animation. Tap to play uh, with a capital P and then we can give that a run and see if that's working. 
So we can see us start off in one position and then after the delete, we start to move around to the other. That looks pretty groovy. Now, of course, uh, we doesn't actually go back to the player. You can, I just spawn at the top of that building. If I jump down, well, it's going to be a bit difficult to play the game with the camera stuck up here. So ideally, we'd like to set the camera back to the player again after it's done. So if we go back into our script, we're going to want to set the camera type uh, back to the default. So let's copy this line, put it down here. And instead of uh, scriptable this time, it's going to be the default, which is custom. And next up, we're going to need the camera subject. Now the camera subject is going to be the player's humanoid. So first we're going to need to get the player. Then we're going to need their character. And if it hasn't loaded in yet, we're going to wait for it. And now we can get their humanoid. And now finally we can set the camera subject to their humanoid. And of course we don't want to do this immediately. We actually want to wait until the tween has finished. So right after we tap to play, uh, let's add camtween dot completed, and then we're going to add a wait here. So this is an event that wait that only fires once the tween has finished. So it's going to stop here, and then when it stopped, then we'll reset it. Let's see if that's working for us. We tween round, and hopefully when it finishes, yeah, we're back to our spawn. There we go. So we've got a little intro cutscene there. Okay, so that's a good start, but let's say I want to make it look a bit more movie-ish. Maybe add some text as well. Well, for that, I'm going to need a GUI now. So if you go over here, you see I've already added in this cutscene GUI. And if I click Enabled, you can see I've got these two uh, black frames here, which kind of provide a sort of letterbox movie-style viewing. I've also got a text frame, and I've got a few text boxes in here. So I could add some text... In here, I could say, um, hello world would be the classic. Subtitle, we could have something as well. Welcome, and so on. So I could start to add all these bits of text onto the script. Let's have a go at adding something, shall we? So in order to do that, I'm gonna move the local script over from starter player scripts and into my cutscene GUI now. And if we head into the script, maybe we can change some of this config. Uh, we're not going to need to wait to have this delay anymore, so we can get rid of that. And then we could change some of the text, for instance. So let's create some variables for the text to make things a bit easier. So we'll have one for the GUI, then one for the dialogue, and one for the title and subtitle text. So now I can start to set the text of all of these down in the script. One thing I could do is I could start to set them after we've started the play. Uh, but before the tween is actually finished. So down here, maybe we could have a wait. So it's four seconds long, remember the tween. So maybe we'll wait for one second and then we'll start setting the text. So title. And then the subtitle we could set to the name of the map, for instance. And then when all of this is finished, we'll want to disable the GUI itself. So right at the bottom here, once we've reset the camera, we want to set the GUI.enables property to be equal to false, so it won't display anymore. Another thing we could also do, which can make it feel a little bit more cinematic, is change the field of view as well. So the default field of view is 70, but if we bring this down a little bit to say 50, it can just help the, the cinematic feel, I think. So let's change it to 50 and then reset it back to 70. Let's see what that's looking like. So we spawn in, we're straight into the cutscene, we've got chapter one, and there we go. Maybe that was a little bit quick, but we could spend all day messing about with those timings. Instead, let's try something different. So you'll see I've added in two new cameras and I've got two new characters. I've got one down here and I've got Gnome Code himself up here. And what I'm going to do is we're going to add in some dialogue between those two characters now. So now back in our script, after we've come finished the tween, Let's go and set the camera to those positions and so we can start setting some dialogue for each of those characters. I'll also going to add in a quick wait and disable the text of both of these before we do so. Maybe I'll wait two seconds and then I'll go over to the other character and put some text for them. So obviously that's a pretty basic example, but if we go and play it now, we can see what it's looking like. 
We've got the opening tween, chapter one, the city. And then we should go over to the other character. Who built this city? It says we built this city on rock and roll. It's all a bit quick, and again, we'll probably want to adjust those timings, but you get the idea. Now, what would be really nice if we could have a transition with the text, because when the text just flashes up on the screen like that in a block, well, it's not really that interesting. Instead, let's see if we can type it out slowly. So in order to do this, we're going to need a super handy function called string.sub. Now, this takes three parameters. It First off, it takes a sentence, or a string, or a bunch of text, and then you choose where you want to slice the sentence uh, and to get a, a new string, a substring. So you choose a starting point. So let's say the start of it, which would be one, and then a random point, so let's say six. And then if we print this out when the game runs, put this at the beginning, then we can see how it works. So remember the full sentence is, this is a bunch of random text. We run the game, we can see I only get this space I. And if we count the characters, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And of course, we went one to six. So we're only getting the first six characters here. Now, this is going to be really handy for making a typing effect. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new function that we're going to use. Uh, we can call this uh, type message. And we'll expect the parameter of whatever text we want. And then in this function, we're going to create a loop and we're going to repeat for how many characters there are in the message. So we can use hashtag txt to see the number of or the length of the message. And then this will repeat for however many characters there are. And so we're going to set the dialogue's text to be equal to a substring using the string.sub function. So string.sub and the text. So that's the message. Our starting point is going to be one. And the point we want to slice it at, well, that's going to be whatever i is equal to. Then we're going to want to wait between every uh, character we print. So let's try uh, 0.2. And then we can call this function from down here when we're setting the text. And the same for down here as well. And then we'll give it another one. Chapter 1, the city. So now we have the text slowly appear. That is very slow. We probably want to make that a little bit quicker. And when that finishes, we go over to me, and then I'm going to type it out. Another way of doing this, instead of just saying wait 0.2, is we could actually uh, give a another parameter for the function. So we could say type time, and this will be equal to uh, however long we want it to be. So here we'll say wait, and we'll do type time divided by however long the thing is. So then when we call our function, we can just say we want this one to last uh, two seconds and maybe this one to last three seconds. And we'll reduce these weights down to one again. Let's see how that is. There we go, that looks a bit faster, a bit more natural. And there we go. Hopefully that helps to get you set up with your very first cutscene system. Uh, hopefully it's helpful and if it is then be sure to leave a like and let me know down in the comments what you're going to use this for. Goodbye! Wait! What about Teddy? Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Now for the actual game we're going to be using all the same stuff as shown here and I'll be copying over the very same GUI you've just seen. The only difference is for these types of games, we're going to have a lot of different cutscenes. So it's not really practical to have like 20 different GUIs or with very similar versions of the same thing. And this would make it really difficult to edit. So we'll need to take a slightly different approach to coding this to make things a bit more streamlined. It's also worth bearing in mind that we need to handle different player states. So we don't always show everybody the same cutscene only to certain players. For example, when they start the round or manage to escape. So, to help with all this, I did a bit of house clearing. First, there's a property of the GUI called Reset on Spawn, and I set this to false for both the cutscene and menu GUI to make this a little bit easier to handle remote events. Although doing this will mean we'll need to clear out any of those placeholders we create on the intermission screen. I can just do this with a simple loop and then just check it's an image label and it's not the template itself. Another thing I'll need to know is whether a player in the round info is alive or dead. 
Seeing as we already have these string values for each player in the folder, I can use the value of these as their status. So when they first join the game, I can set the value to alive. Uh, I'll then add in another function to detect when they die, so I can change it to dead. I'm also going to toggle the main menu UI here as well. Then, if you remember, we created this separate script to detect when the humanoid of a character dies. We were using this in combination with the keys. It doesn't really make much sense for this to exist here anymore, so we can put that inside the function as well. Okay, so now all that is out of the way, let's start getting this set up. Now in the cutscene GUI, I've got this local script called cutscene handler, but if we look inside it, you'll see it's completely empty. Now I'm not going to actually set all of the cutscene from inside the script, because I want my other scripts to tell the cutscene what to show. So I'm going to have a remote event. So if we go into replicated storage events, and I've got a couple already, so I'm going to create a new one, and we'll just call this toggle cutscene. And we're going to set all of this up later. But for now, let's just create a variable for the events. And then we're going to fire the event whenever, or sorry, when the event is fired, then we're going to want to hook it into this function. So when the event is fired to the client, then we're going to want to do something here. But obviously we're not firing this from anywhere yet. So let's head back into our player script over here. And it's we're going to have a new function inside the player module script that's going to work pretty similarly to the uh, respawn all players function. And we're going to call this one, we'll copy and paste it, and we're going to name it cutscene all or show all cutscene. We're going to want to loop through the round info and then get the game player and if they are then we're going to want to fire that cutscene. We're also going to want to check that they're alive, remembering that status. So the round player refers to the round info. So let's check if player dot value equals alive and they are a game player, so they actually exist. Um, then we're not going to want to reload them. What we're going to want to do is fire that event. So I'm just going to copy this paste it back into here and fire client and we're going to send it to the game player. Okay, now the other information that I want to send the player is what cutscene we want. Now we're going to have a chapter and also the cutscene for that chapter. So chapter and cutscene are going to be the two parameters we're going to send. And we need to make sure that we have these as parameters for the function as well. So then we're going to call this function from within our game logic. So remember back over here, we're going to want to show everyone a cutscene after they've teleported onto the map. So right here. And of course we can just put chapter one and the cutscene will be the intro. Now later on when we have different maps, we're not going to be hard coding these. We're going to have something else that's going to tell us uh, what the name of the chapter is. But for now we can just do this, so chapter 1 intro, and then after the countdown has finished for the game, then the game's over. And if they're still on the map, then we might want to show them some kind of outro, where uh, showing them they've been trapped. And then we're going to need something else later on to trigger them for when they escape. But we're not going to worry about that just yet. So we're just going to focus on these that are shown to everyone, if they're alive and if they're in the game. Now the way we're going to control all of these cutscenes is with a brand new folder. So in replicated storage, we're going to create a folder and we're going to call this cutscenes. And then we're going to have, first of all, a new module script. This is going to be the cutscene module. And then we're going to have a folder for each chapter. So we're going to start off with just one folder and this is just going to be called chapter one. And then obviously we'll be having a script inside here. And we'll just create an intro for now. And so how this is going to work is our cutscene module is going to handle all the kind of functions we might want to run within our cutscene. And then the intro one can just call those functions rather than having to repeat ourselves for each different cutscene. So let's create a few things we might need inside here. I'm going to start off by declaring a few variables. Now remember this is going to be a local script eventually because this one is going to be called by this intro local script. So although at the moment it's a module script and it's in replicator storage, eventually this script will actually be running from inside the player's GUI. So this will be referring to their current camera. Then we're going to get those game players. 
And then we're going to create variables for each of the player's UI, which in this case would be the cutscene, the game and the menu GUI. And it's inevitable that we're going to want tween service as well at some point. So our first function is just going to be to set everything up. This isn't going to take any parameters and all it's going to do is set the camera to scriptable. And then we're going to want to disable the game GUI. At the moment this just contains the game countdown but it might contain some other things later on. And then enable the cutscene GUI. And then to make things look a bit more cinematic let's change the camera's field of view to 60. So that will set everything up nicely. The next function is also going to be super simple and this is just going to be to set the camera. And this is going to take one parameter of a target C frame. And all this is going to do is just going to be a single line. So camera.c frame, and we're just going to set it to whatever the target is. Now I could argue it's a bit silly to have one function just for a single line, but this will just make things look a little bit cleaner, I reckon. The next function will be to move the camera. And this is going to take a target as well, as well as how long we want the tween to take. So let's just set up a super simple tween. And then we can play this tween and wait for it to be completed. Next, let's have a function to set some text. This is going to expect the label and the message we want to send. So the label in this case will be the actual uh, text label we want. Because remember, inside that text frame, we've got a dialogue, a subtitle, and a title object. So we could set it for either of these. So how this will work is we'll go to the scene GUI, and then we go to the text, and then we can use the square brackets and just type the name of the label. And then we set the text of that to be equal to whatever the message we want is. So again, it's all just on one line. So that will just set the text all in one go, but we might also want to have the text type out like we did earlier. And here we'll need the label again, the message, and also how long we want this to take. And finally, we're going to set one last function to reset everything back to normal. So we're going to set the camera back to the normal field of view and disable this cutscene UI. And we're probably also going to want to reset all the text back to nil again. So we can loop through all of these. And then finally what happens next is going to depend on whatever's happening in the game. So whether it's an intro or an outro. So we might want to reset back to the player or we might want to reset back to the menu. So let's change our function a little bit. And instead of just calling it reset, we'll call it reset to. And then we'll expect a parameter to be the state that we want to reset it to. So if the state is player, then we'll give them the, their default camera type, which is custom. And then if we're going back to the player, that must mean the game is starting. So let's enable the game GUI again. And if we're not setting to the player, then the other alternative must be the menu. And in this case, we're going to want to set their camera to the back to the position of the menu cam. We'll make their menu visible. And we'll disable the game GUI. So that should reset everything back to normal once we're done. So now we can start using these functions back in our intro script. So all we need to do is get replicated storage and then find that module script. And obviously this will be using require. So now I have all those pieces sorted. All I have to do to write my cutscene is to start linking in all those functions. So that's a super basic example I could do just using a few of those functions. And you can see now when I look in this intro script, it's very easy to see what's happening. It sets it up with the position of the camera gives it some text and then moves the camera before resetting. So it's very easy to just see what the script is doing at a quick glance. Now in order to get this actually working, we're going to need to make sure our event is working. Now remember we set up this function earlier on to receive the remote event being fired toggle cutscene. Now we were actually sending some information along with it. We were sending the information of the chapter and also the cutscene. So now what we need to do is find the folder containing all our cutscenes and then pick the right one. 
So remember they're contained in replicated storage, cutscenes, chapter one, and then this one is intro. So we'll create a variable for the cutscenes. And then we're gonna to want to clone the script for whatever cutscene they want. So we can do this by going to cutscenes and then we're gonna select whichever chapter they want. So we do this in square brackets followed by uh, the name of the cutscene. So if it's intro, for example, and then we're gonna clone that and then set its parent to parent of our own script. So script.parent. So its parent is gonna be inside the cutscene GUI, remember? So now when we run our basic example, we'll be able to see it in action. So we click play, wait for ourselves to load in. The game starts, we see the camera panning in, and then we'll get onto the map. And you see we've only got six seconds left on the clock. So we've lost those initial four seconds. Now, the reason for this is of course, if we look in our game logic here, well, it's just doing this, showing us the cutscene, and then immediately starting the countdown. What we really need is some kind of way to wait for the cutscene to finish before we actually start the game countdown clock. So what we're going to do for this is we're going to use something called a bindable event. Inside our player module, we're going to add in a bindable event. And these are a bit like a remote event, but instead of being a way of talking between the client and the server, this is just for talking on the server, a way of allowing scripts to communicate with each other uh, uses Roblox script signals, just like a touched event, for example. So it's like our own custom event. And we're gonna name this one cutscene ended. So now here in our player module show all cutscene function, after we've leaped through all the players, we're going to get that remote, sorry, not the remote, the bindable event. So we can say script dot cutscene ended. And when that is fired, so it will be dot event, and then we're just gonna wait, just like we would with any other event. But now we just need a way for that event to actually be fired in the first place. So to do this, I'm gonna use a remote event. So head into my replicator storage, into my events, and add in a remote event, and we'll just name this one uh, cutscene finished. So then I head into my cutscene module, right down to the bottom where I get the reset to area. And then I'm not sure if I've actually got a variable for the events yet, so we might need one of them as well. And then I can fire that event. So now every single one of the clients will be firing this remote event when they finish each of their cutscenes. So we're gonna to need to handle that. So back in our player module script and over here. So after we've shown them all the cutscene, so we've looped through them all, then we're gonna to want to detect that remote event being firing. And when a client is telling us that they finished the cutscene, then we're going to want to fire that bindable event on the client. So script.cutscene ended, and we'll say fire. And we don't want this to fire every single time. So we might have one player in the game, or we might have 10. And they're all going to be sending us this remote event. So we're not interested in all the subsequent firings of it. So what we're going to do is going to disconnect this remote event then. So how we do this is we can put it inside a variable like this. And then below, we can check if it exists. So now when I play the game, I'm gonna get my cutscene again. And hopefully once it finishes, we should have the full seconds on the clock. There we go, we're now starting counting down from 10, just like we'd expect. Then if we want to have an outro camera, it's just as simple as creating some more parts. So you see I've already got some over here, inside the map look. And then I can just duplicate the existing script. So we've got the intro, duplicate it and then we can rename it outro. Now if you remember back in the game logic we're already calling something called outro so we don't need to do anything there. And then into our outro script well we can just change a few details. Now we can have both our intro cutscene, we can play the game and when we don't manage to escape we'll get shown game over cutscene. And if we then want to have a cutscene to escape, well, that's nice and easy as well. You see I've already gone and placed a cube over here called the exit cube. And so when they touch this cube, we want to trigger the exit. So I've got this script in here. I've already got variables for the round info and the events. So now I just need to detect when they touch it. So that's really easy. So this function will then fire whenever anything touches the part. So first off, we want to check that it's actually a player that's contained within the round info. 
So this will look through the round info players folder and then look to see if there's anything matching the name of the parent which is just hit. So if it's a character, then their name will be the name of their player. So we can just create a variable for that. Then we'll want to check they're still alive when they hit. And finally, it's probably be a good idea to check they're still in the game because they could be in the round info, but they could have actually left the game. So let's check they're still in the game by searching through the player service. So now everything seems to be in order. Let's change their status. Uh, we can call it escaped. And then we can fire that event to trigger the, to toggle the cutscene. And we're gonna fire it to the game player. And we're gonna request the exit cutscene for chapter one. And the exit. And of course the cutscene itself is already being handled by a local script. So I've gone and created a local script down here in the replicator storage. I've got my exit script. Of course, it's very similar to these outro and intro ones I've already created. And we can see it when I play the game now. If instead of waiting for the outro, I go straight to this cube, it will trigger, you escaped for now. And then we're back to the menu again. Now, one of the problems of that is that it still thinks we're in the game. So if I try to click play now, it's probably not going to start the next round. So we're gonna to have to look at how to start and stop the game unexpectedly uh, in a future video rather than just relying on the timer. But again, that's not quite covered on the cutscene level. Now there's one final thing I want to show you, and that is how to create a clone of ourselves so we can use our own character in the cutscenes. Now the great thing about this cutscene module is it makes it really easy for us to add in new functions. But if we want to create a clone of the player's character, we're actually gonna to need to do that on the server. So we're gonna head into our player module script and over here, we're going to throw in a new function to create a clone. So what we'll do is we'll get the player's character. And then we'll create a clone of that character. Now, the important thing here is you can't actually create a clone directly from the character. What you need to do first is you'll actually need to set the character to archivable and make sure that's set to true. Uh, if this isn't set to true, then you won't be able to copy it. Then we'll set a few new properties for the clone. So we'll name it avatar rather than it having the same name as the player, which could be a bit confusing. And then we're going to change the humanoid so it doesn't display the player's name above their head. And then we're going to set a parent for it. Now, rather than putting it inside the workspace, where everybody's gonna see it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it inside that round info and replicated storage. And then we'll leave it up to the local script to actually put it into workspace so only that local player will be able to see the clone. So then we'll need to call this function from somewhere and a good place as any is probably when we show everyone the cutscene. So seeing as we're looping, looping through all the players already, we might as well create a clone ready for when we show them the intro cutscene. So now let's start handling this clone. So back in our cutscene module, we can create a few functions for us to use. So right at the top here, we're gonna create a new function and we're gonna call this one setup character or position character. So we'll start off by getting the rig. So we get the player from the players on the round info and then we're gonna get the avatar inside of that. And then we're going to clone it. Then we'll set the parent of rig to workspace. Now remember, seen as this will be inside a local script, we're only changing its parent on the client. So back on the server, the rig won't be moving at all and no one else will be able to see it other than the players who is running this local script. And then finally, we're gonna set its prime part C frame to wherever the target that we're specifying is. We can also then create functions to animate and make the character move where anim name will be the name of the animation we want to play. So we'll start off by getting the rig again, uh, but this time, seeing as we've already gonna have set it up, we're assuming that we'll have positioned it before we try to animate it. So we can just go straight to the workspace and look for something called avatar. Now, seeing as this is a player's character, it's already gonna contain an animate script within it. So we can get the animation from that animation script. So then if the animation exists, then we'll get the animation track. 
and then play it. Another function we could create would be one to get the character to move. So all we have to do is get their rig again and tell their humanoid to move to the target. And we might as well get them to animate as well so we can use this function and try and tell them to walk. Okay, so now that we have all of our pieces together, I put it all and I made something a little bit more robust. So let's click play and I'll show you what I have at the moment. Chapter one, Teddy Daycare. I hope mummy picks me up soon. That teddy is starting to creep me out. <laughs> mummy! <laughs> and there we go, we can play the game. So that's about wraps up this episode of Cutscenes. I hope you found the content useful and you can start to make some awesome cutscenes of your own. And that's all for now. I'll see you all, you all you awesome people, in the next video. Goodbye! Thank you.